for the corporate finance and today's topic is merger and acquisition to take you through this topic is mr kairo magutu we will look at uh, the syllabus as it is given by the examiner that is kasnep and i want to give you the breakdown of on what you are supposed of what you are supposed to cover then from there we can get into the details of each and every subtopic under the merger and acquisition under this topic the first thing should be definition of merger and acquisition uh, under which we will look at the classification of merger and acquisition then we look at the common motivation and demotivations behind merger and acquisition we will also look at the eps before the merger and acquisition and the post acquisition eps we will also look at the relationship between merger motivation and type of mergers then we look at the contrast merger transaction characteristic by form of acquisition method of payment and attitude of target management we also look at the pre-offer defense mechanism and post-offer takeover defense mechanism then from there we look at the discounted cash flow analysis we also look at computation of free cash flows for a target company the next one will the next one is estimation of the value of the target company using corporate company and uh, co comparable company and comparable transaction analysis we also look at evaluation of takeover bid the next one is effect of price and payment method to the uh, to the distribution of risk and benefit in merger and acquisition transaction then characteristics of merger and acquisition transaction that create value and the last thing we need to cover under the merger and acquisition is transaction for uh, reasons for failed mergers now to start with we need to understand what merger and acquisition is so the first thing here is merger and acquisition so the topic is merger and acquisition under the topic merger and acquisition we need to understand first what do we mean when we talk of merger what it mean when we talk of acquisition we must understand the definition of these two terms and actually what it mean when we say that two or more farms merged together or a farm acquired another farm to, uh, to begin with, we understand what merger is. The merger, this is a combination of two or more farms where the identity of each farm disappears after the acquisition. Simply, in a merger, if you have a company A, you combine it with another company B, you get a company C the identity of the two farms that are being combined together disappears after the uh, after the merger so simply merger is a combination of two or more farms after which the identity of the two farms that are merging disappears and a completely new farm is formed that is merger the next one we talk of acquisition in an acquisition, also known as the takeover bid, it means that two farms come together, but the identity of one farm dominates the other farm. When two farms come together, there is that farm that will retain its identity. So simply, we can say that if we have a farm A that has come together with a farm B, we will get a farm A. So it is a farm A that acquired farm B. So the identity that disappears is for the farm that is being acquired. The farm that acquires another farm is known as a predator. The farm that is being acquired is known as the target. So when a company acquires the other farm, the identity of the predator is retained the identity of the target disappears that is an acquisition uh, an acquisition or uh, actually an acquisition 
in, uh, in a, where businesses combine together. Then, of course, we've understood what merger is. Now, having understood what merger is and what acquisition is, we need to look at the classification of merger and acquisition. Classification of merger and acquisition. For the purpose of this topic, that is merger and acquisition, we'll be using merger and acquisition interchangeably for all purpose as if they mean the same. So you find that a question on merger or a question on acquisition will be tested the same way. So we need to understand the type or the way mergers and acquisitions are. The first one, we talk of horizontal merger or acquisition. The horizontal merger. Number two, we talk of vertical merger or acquisition. And the third one, we talk of conglomerate merger or acquisition. So in the classification of merger and acquisition, there is horizontal merger and acquisition, there is vertical merger and acquisition, there is conglomerate merger and acquisition. To start with, let us start with the horizontal merger or acquisition. What do we mean when we talk of the horizontal merger and acquisition? In this case, two firms are combined together, and these two firms are in the same level of business. For example, we can have two banks combining together. They are at the same level of activity. So if we have a bank A, you add a bank B, you will have one entity. In a horizontal merger, it is simply a combination of two or more firms that are at the same level of activity. That is the horizontal merger. The main objective or purpose for a horizontal merger is to ensure that there is increase in market share. As a result, the firm will enjoy the economies of scale. So when we have the horizontal merger, the services or the goods offered by the, the, the merging company is the same. So as a result of that, the two firms becomes one big entity offering the same, uh, offering the, the same services and similar goods. So they enjoy the economies of scale. Number two, we talk of the vertical merger or acquisition. In a vertical merger or acquisition, this is where two entities at different level of activities combine together to form a completely new entity. For example, if you have one entity X, there is another entity Y, the output, output of entity Y is an input, input for entity X. That is a vertical merger. Two firms which may be in the same industry, but one firm's output is an input for the other firm. In such a case, when the two firms come together, we say that it is a vertical merger. The vertical merger in this case ensures that the output of one firm will be an input of the other firm, and as a result, there is a ready market for the output for the one firm. The other thing is that the firm whose input is an output of the other firm is guaranteed of the supply of the input. So the major uh, objective of vertical merger is that there is creation or provision of market for, the, for one firm's output. And again, on the other end, there is a guarantee supply of input for the other firm. Then we have the other type of merger, number three. This is what you call the conglomerate 
merger. In a conglomerate merger, this is where two or more firms in completely different industries come together to form a new firm. You have a firm A and a firm B. You combine them together, but they are in different industry. For example, this firm may be in manufacturing and this one is in communication. Or you have one firm in communication industry or the other one is in the banking industry. When you look at the two firms, they are not, they are not related. They are in different industries. They offer different goods and different services. When such a combination occurs, we talk of conglomerate merger or acquisition. And what is the main objective? What is the main reason for conglomerate merger? The main objective for conglomerate merger is to ensure that there is risk diversification. And the risk diversification is usually achieved when the correlation between the returns of the two firms, that is the correlation between the returns of the two firms is negative, such that when one firm is generating income, the other one may not be generating income. When one firm performance is low, the other firm's performance is high. In such a case, it guarantees the investor continued income throughout the year. So we talk of the conglomerate merger with an objective of risk diversification, and it is achieved when the correlation coefficient between the returns of the two, uh, of the two firms are negative. So we having understood that, what merger and acquisition is, we have the types of merger, the horizontal merger. We say that two firms at the same level of activity combines together to form a completely new entity. Vertical merger, this is where we have two firms which may be in the same industry, but they are in di at a different level of activity. A good example, we can have a car assembling company acquiring a tire manufacturing firm. A car assembling firm requires the output of a tire manufacturing firm as its input. That makes uh, the combination a vertical merger. The output of one firm is an input of the other firm. The other one is the conglomerate merger. We say that it is a combination of two or more firms in different industries with an objective of risk diversification. So that is the general overview or understanding of what merger and acquisition is. Now, when you talk of the merger and acquisition, a very important concept we need to understand is that when firms are coming together, each firm has its shareholders. They are all the owners in each firm. For a firm, for a firm shareholders to release their ownership and they join the other firm, there must be some consideration. Simply, if a firm X want to acquire a firm Y. This X, the acquiring, we said is a predator. The firm being acquired, that is firm Y, we said is a target. When this firm predator is acquiring the target, the shareholders in the target must be compensated to forgo their ownership in firm Y so that they can become either shareholders in firm X or they can go, they are paid, they leave their ownership. Now, how do we get the forms of consideration? How are the, uh, the shareholders in the target firm compensated to forego their ownership? There are various forms of consideration and the most common ones are, number one is cash consideration. Cash consideration. Number two, we have share for share exchange. Share for share exchange. Number three, 
we talk of issue of convertible securities. The issue of convertible securities. And the fourth one, we talk of a combination. A combination of any two or the three above forms. So a combination of any two or the three above forms, that means we can have partial consideration in cash and issue of shares or cash and issue of convertible securities or issue shares and partially convertible securities or a combination of the three where the shareholders in the target are paid cash, they are issued with some shares, they are issued with convertible securities. So the forms of consideration, we need to understand what are the implications of cash consideration, the implication of share for share exchange, the implication of issue of convertible securities as form of consideration in a merger and acquisition. I want us to start with the cash consideration. We see what are the implications when the shareholders of the target firm are paid in cash. That is cash consideration. Now, let's start with that one. We say number one, cash consideration. The cash consideration. Now, when it comes to the cash consideration, it means that if a firm X want to acquire a firm Y, this is the predator and this is the target. The predator want to acquire the target. There are shareholders in this firm Y, the shareholders in the target firm, and there are shareholders in firm X. When making a decision to acquire and they agree that the shareholders in Y will be paid in form of cash, it means the predator firm will purchase the ownership in Y and the shareholders or the owners in Y will be paid in cash. They forgo their ownership. So what is the implication of that? Number one, there is huge cash outflow huge cash outflow from the predator huge cash outflow from the predator which may cause liquidity charges in the predator entity number two is that there is no dilution and control of ownership in the predator. We talk of no dilution or uh, no dilution in ownership and control of the predator entity. The shares or the shareholders in the predator entity will retain their control or their ownership in the farm because the shareholders of the target company will be paid in cash and they will leave their interest in the investment. The other one, number three, no change in gearing of the, of the predator farm. The gearing level does not change. This is because there is no issue of debt. There is no change in the equity level. There is no change in the debt level of the predator farm. So as a result, when the shareholders in the target are paid, there, there will be no change in the amount of equity and the, in the amount of debt. The other one, number four, is that the shareholders in the target are paid and using the proceeds, they can invest in risk-free securities. The investment in farm Y may be considered risky. When the shareholders in Y are paid, that is in the target entity are paid, they can use the proceeds 
to move from a risk venture to a risk free secu to risk free securities that is use the proceeds and invest them in the in the government securities the other one number 5 is that there is no transaction cost no transaction cost means that unlike the issue on sale of shares in the market where a shareholder will go to the market and try to sell the shares under merger and acquisition where shareholders are paid in cash they do not incur transaction cost so simply these are the implications of cash consideration when an entity target shareholders are paid in cash now we look at the next form of consideration and we've talked of share for share exchange or oh, before we look at the share for share exchange i would want us to start with issue of convertible securities the issue of convertible securities now what do we mean by issue of convertible securities number two this is issue of convertible securities now the convertible securities this is where the shareholders in the target are issued by some securities from the predator entity the shareholders in the target entity will forego their equity in this firm and they are given securities like debentures like preference shares like loan stock such that after the merger and uh, after the merger or acquisition the shareholders in the target becomes lenders in the uh, in the predator so they they are entitled to preference dividend at the end of the year they are entitled to interest at the end of the year in case they are issued with the preference shares they will be paid preference dividend in case they are issued with the loan stock or the bangers or any other form of debt that attract interest they will be paid interest at the end of the financial period so the target shareholders no longer becomes shareholders in the predator they become lenders in the predator so they continue as investors in the predator entity but at a different level as compared to what they were before the merger and acquisition now what are the implications of this form of consideration that is when the shareholders in a firm being acquired are issued with the debentures or they are issued with the preference shares the first one is that it increases the gearing ratio in the predator firm when a predator issued debentures or preference shares to the shareholders in the target the gearing or the level of debt in the predator firm increases it therefore increases or raises the financial risk in the predator entity that is implication number 1 implication number 2 there is no dilution in ownership and control no dilution in ownership and control of the predator firm this is because the shares in the predator will not change after the merger and acquisition they retain their shares at the same level so there is no dilution in ownership and control the shareholders in the predator retains their ownership in that firm no change in the ordinary share capital structure the other one number three it conserve cash for predator this form of consideration will conserve cash for predator this is because no cash payment that is done to the target so the cash is retained in the predator and the predator cannot experience any liquidity charges after the merger and acquisition as a result the firm will have 
stability in cash flow. The other one, number four, is that the predator enjoys interest tax shield benefit. The predator, if the predator issued debentures, loan stock to the shareholders in the target, the predator will pay interest at the end of the year. Such interest is allowable for tax purposes. To that end, the predator company will enjoy interest tax shield, interest tax shield, which is equivalent to interest per annum times tax rate. So the predator will enjoy interest tax shield, which is a benefit to the firm because interest is allowable for tax purposes, unlike the dividends that are payable by a company to its shareholders. The interest is allowable. Now, when you look at this, they are the, the implications of issue of convertible securities. Now, the other one we need to look at, we need to look at the share for share exchange. This is very common in most firms. And when you talk of the share for share exchange, we need to understand it in a very detailed way. And that is what I want us to look at. And this is number three. Number three, this is share for share exchange. The share for share exchange. A share for share exchange arises when a predator company issues some shares to the shareholders in the target in exchange for the shares held by the shareholders in the target. <coughs> at this point, we look at the predator acquiring another entity, the target. The predator will issue its shares to the shareholders in the target. So the shareholders in the target becomes a part of the owners in the predator. Before we look at how to go about the share for share exchange, we can look at the implication of this approach of consideration in a merger and acquisition. The implication number one, there is, uh, there is dilution in ownership and control of predator firm. The predator will issue new shares to shareholders in the target. So the number of shares in the predator increases. More shareholders are brought into the predator company. So as a result of that, the ownership is diluted and the control is diluted in the predator entity. Number two is that it lowers the gearing. It lowers the gearing ratio. That means the amount of equity in the predator increases with the debt remaining constant. So it lowers the gearing ratio in the predator entity. At the same time, it reduces the financial risk in the predator entity. Number three, it conserves cash to predator entity. It conserves cash to predator entity. That means that the predator entity is not likely to suffer liquidity charges after the merger and acquisition where shareholders in the target are issued with the shares and they, bec they become shareholders in the predator entity. So the cash in the predator is retained in the predator. There is no charges or there are no charges in the liquidity of the predator. Now, having understood this, there are some other aspects of merger and acquisition that we need to understand, especially when you talk of the share for share exchange. In any arrangement of merger and acquisition, there must be an agreement on 
exchange ratio. An exchange ratio is determined based on the market price per share for the shares in the predator entity and the shares in the target entity. So the first thing we need to understand under merger and acquisition, we need to understand what is exchange ratio. How many shares should be issued by the predator for how many shares in the target? We say that exchange ratio is equal to the offer price. Price by predator over market price per share of predator. The offer price by the predator, this is the amount the predator company is willing to pay for every share held by a shareholder in the target entity. You divide by the market price per share of the shares in the predator company. The price at which the shares in the predator company are trading in the market. So we determine an exchange ratio. That one must be determined. The other thing that must be considered when uh, a farm is acquiring another farm or in case of a merger is that number two, the farms in, uh, the shareholders in the two farms may get into, a, into an agreement or they, they may arrive into an exchange ratio that will guarantee them an EPS similar to what it was before the merger and acquisition. And this is called the non-dilutive exchange ratio. ratio. A non-dilutive exchange ratio, it is an exchange ratio that will ensure that the EPS for the target shareholders and the EPS for the predator shareholders will not change or they will get the same EPS as it was before the merger and acquisition, even after the merger and acquisition. So the non-dilutive exchange ratio is given by non-dilutive offer price, price, you divide by the market price per share of predator. The non-dilutive offer price divided by the market price per share of the predator or it is given by the earnings per share in target before merger. Before merger divided by the EPS in predator before merger. The non-dilutive exchange ratio is determined by determining non-dilutive offer price. An offer price that the shareholders in the predator are willing to pay for a share in the target without diluting the EPS divided by the market price per share of the predator or in the pre, uh, of the predator shares. The other way of getting a non-dilutive exchange ratio is you get the earnings per share in the predator company, in the target company, you divide by the earnings per share in the predator company before the merger or acquisition. Now, how do we get the non-dilutive offer price? Non-dilutive offer price is based on the price earnings, uh, price earnings ratio in the predator and the EPS of the target. So we say that non-dilutive offer price is equal to price earnings ratio ratio in predator, that is predator company, multiplied by the EPS in target. 
both before the acquisition. So we need the non-dilutive offer price that will help us get non-dilutive exchange ratio. The non-dilutive offer price is given by the earnings per share in the predator multiplied by the earnings per share in the target entity. So either using this approach or the second approach where we have the EPS in the target before the merger over EPS in predator before the merger, you will get a non-dilutive exchange ratio. And this is an exchange ratio that guarantees the shareholders in both companies an EPS equivalent to what they were earning before the merger and acquisition. Now, this EPS we are talking about is the EPS after merger and acquisition and which is known as number three, the post acquisition EPS. The acquisition after the merger and acquisition uh, after the merger and acquisition. So how do we get that EPS? After the two firms have come together, they will form a completely new entity. And this completely new entity will have shareholders, those in the predator before the merger, and the new shareholders after the merger in case of share for share exchange. In case of other forms of consideration, the, the shares in the predator before the merger and acquisition will remain constant even after the merger and acquisition. So to get the post acquisition earnings per share, we say that this is equal to the combined earnings to ordinary shareholders. In the, that is, earnings, the combined earnings to ordinary shareholders for the predator plus the earnings to ordinary shareholders in the target. This one you divide by the number of ordinary shares in predator before merger or the acquisition. This we add new shares issued to shareholders in target. In case of merger and acquisition, where shareholders in the target entity are issued with the new shares, the new shares are added to the shares in the predator before the merger and acquisition to form the total shares in the predator after the merger. So when you take the combined earnings, that is the earnings to ordinary shareholders in the predator plus earnings to ordinary shareholders in the target, you divide by the total shares after the merger and acquisition, that gives the post-acquisition EPS. So if the non-dilutive exchange ratio was used in, the in that merger and acquisition, the EPS after the acquisition that we resort here will, uh, will be equivalent to the EPS in the predator before the merger and acquisition. Now, for the shareholders in the target, the comparable EPS, that is, that which the shareholder can take as EPS to compare with what they were earning before the merger and acquisition is given by we say that this is number five, number four, we call it comparable. Comparable post acquisition EPS to target shareholders. That which a shareholder in the target company will take and compare with what they were earning in the in the company before the acquisition is the comparable post acquisition EPS to the target shareholders. How do we get this? It is given by the exchange ratio, exchange ratio multiplied by the post acquisition earnings per share. The exchange ratio 
that helped the firms to determine what consideration to be paid, multiplied by the post-acquisition EPS, which is this one, will enable a shareholder in the target to determine the EPS that they can compare with what they were earning or what the EPS was before the merger and acquisition. So these are very important items to understand when it comes to merger and acquisition. Number one, what is exchange ratio? Number two, what is non-dilutive exchange ratio? Number three, what is post-acquisition earnings per share? Number four, how do we get the comparable post-acquisition EPS to target shareholders? Having understood this, comfortably you can answer a question on computation in relation to merger and acquisition. So as we continue with this, or as we look at the further aspects of merger and acquisition, we will look at a question, at a comprehensive question that captures all this. And we need to clearly understand and always remember these formulas for the purpose of examination. So for today, we shall stop there. I believe we'll continue revising. Make sure that you understand all that you have done today so that when we meet next time, we'll be able to attempt a question in relation to the merger and acquisition, we see the various way an examiner can test under this aspect before we can move to the other part of merger and acquisition. So for now, we shall stop there. I believe you will continue doing your revision. I wish you well. We meet next time. God bless you so much. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to get yourself a copy of our professionally prepared study text and revision partners. Visit our shop along Tom Boyer Street, Pioneer House, third floor, opposite fire station. Thank you for attending our study session. Welcome to our today's session. In today's session, we are still dwelling on the introduction to the derivative market and instrument. In our prior lesson, we learned the introduction elements where we saw a derivative being a contract and a contract in which it derives its value from another asset. This other asset, we are calling it what? An underlying. This underlying can be a bond, can be a share, can be a currency or a commodity. We have seen the introduction bit of the types of uh, forward, um, the types of derivative instruments. They were one, the forward commitments. In the forward commitments, we have looked at two. One was the future contract, futures contract, and the forward contracts. In the forward contracts, we have seen they trade under the OTC, unregulated and private engagements market. And then we have seen the futures trade under what? The stock, uh, the securities exchange. They are public transactions. They have lesser risk because of the process we call marking to market. Today, we are still on introduction to derivative market. markets and instruments. Yeah, we have seen uh, the types of types of derivatives We're on the topic types of derivatives. The types of derivatives we have seen forward commitments and in forward commitments we have seen of three 
types. We have seen the futures. We have seen the forwards. And we have seen the swaps. The second type are called contingent claims. In contingent claims, we are talking about what? Options. And then we have hybrid instruments. In hybrid instruments, we have an example to deal with, for example, swaptions. Let us look what we call contingent claims. Contingent claims are derivatives in which the payoff occur if a specific event happens. So what are contingent claims? We are saying that there are derivatives in which the payoffs occur if a specific event happens. Payoffs occur, occur if a specific event happens. What do we mean by this? We refer generally to them by the name option. An option is a financial instrument in which gives one party the right but not the obligation to buy or sell an underlying asset from another party at a fixed price over a specific period. So we generally refer to them as options. And how do options behave? They give the right but not what? The obligation. But not the obligation. And when you have the right, the right to do what? To buy or sell. Okay? The right to buy yeah, or sell. The right to buy is called the right to buy right to buy is called call call such that if you have the right to call buy we'll say we have what a call option then the right to sell here we have what the put option. So we are saying the call option gives the holder the right to buy a what? A financial asset at a future date with a price agreed what? Upon today of a specific time. So we are saying this, the future price is agreed today. Future price is agreed at the start at the start at the start of the contract we are saying is what today over what over a period over a specified period of time specified period of time that is what options are an option that gives the right to buy is referred to as a call. An option that gives the right to sell is referred to as a put. The action of buying or selling is called exercising, uh, exercising the option. So what is this action? When you say you are now want to, uh, to exercise this right. So exercising... exercising the option this is executing the right you are executing 
the right. So when I say we are exercising the core option, I'm saying you are what? Deciding to buy. When I say you are exercising the put option, you have made the decision what? To sell. And when you execute, at what price do you execute? It is called the exercise price. Exercise price. Yeah? So, the action of buying or selling the underlying asset is exercising the option at what? The exercise price. So, the holder who has the right to exercise will only do so if it is advantageous. Otherwise, the option will expire and exercise. We say that in contingent claims, they depend on a particular what? Uh, pay, the, the payoffs depend on a specific event happening. If you want to buy, and this contract that you are signed, you say you are going to buy maybe the KCB share at 50. When the market conditions are that the KCB share is selling maybe for 48 shillings. Of course, no one would like to buy at the expensive price of 50, would like to buy at 48. So therefore, you will not what? Exercise the option, you let it expire. Or put it the other way. If the KCB share is selling at 50, and the contract is what? St stipulating that you will sell. You have the option to sell at 48. Of course, you cannot sell at the raw price when the market is offering what? 50. Therefore, you let the, uh, you let the uh, option expire. So, the payoff, uh, that, that's why we are saying it's a contingent claim. To acquire the right, how do you acquire this right? To acquire the right, the buyer of the option must pay a price at the start of the contract. And this price is called what? The option price or the option premium. At the start of the contract, of contract, the buyer of the right, buyer of the right, who have to pay what? Option premium or option price. The option premium is like a payment so that you acquire the right but not what? The obligation. Because the option buyer has the right to buy or sell the asset, the seller option has the potential what? Commitment to buy. So he gets the right, but the, not the obligation. But the seller of the right must what? Honor the bargain. So they, in options, where, where do options trade? Options can trade in the either the two markets. They can either trade in the OTC, over the counter market, or they can trade what? In the Extra, uh, uh, what the securities exchange market and we have and what seen earlier there are various forms of other various forms of uh, contingent claims other forms other than the options other forms these forms include things like convertible bonds And what are convertible bonds? These are offering the holder the option feature that enables the board holder to participate in the gains in the market price of the corporation's stock without having to participate in the losses of the stock. We are saying if you have a convertible bond and you see to it that, that the stock, what is a convertible bond? Let me start there. A convertible bond is the one that grants the board holder, if it is favorable to him, to convert from the bond to what? To the stock. If the stock prices are moving, 
upwards in a favorable manner. Then he what entice to convert from that being a bond to a share. And we are saying what? It is a type of contingent claim. The other type is called the callable bonds. What are callable bonds? In the case of option of the issuer to pay off the bond before maturity, the borrower, the company that has issued the bond, if the interest rate fall and this bond is with high interest rate, he can what? He can pay off the bond before maturity. We are calling what? The callable bonds. We have asset-backed securities. Assets backed securities. We know that an asset backed security is a claim on a pool of securities. We have learned that elsewhere. And this pool might be like mortgage loans or a portfolio combined. And then with asset backed security, they have a future that when the interest rate for all people can make what more payment than the scheduled payment and this feature of them having more payment than the scheduled payment we are calling what the prepayment feature so we have seen the various what contingent claims are let us touch on hybrid instruments With hybrid instruments, we are saying these are combinations of the various the various forms of derivatives of derivatives. For example, we can have a swap option. What is a swap? We say that a swap is an arrangement between one party to exchange either the fixed with the variable. So with a swap here, swap here, we are saying there is party A and there is party B. Party A is currently paying loans at a fixed rate. Party A is currently paying this at a fluctuating fluctuating rate but b would like to get exposure to the fixed rates but the a would like to get exposure to what the the fluctuating or the variable rate so the exchange they have created a swap what if this contract has the options as the options that I will exchange when certain interest rate reach or when certain interest rate decline. Then when that combination is combined with swaps, we have what? Swaptions. And that's how we get the hybrid instruments. We are supposed to look at the other item which we call the purpose of derivative markets. What are the purpose of derivative markets? Why do we have derivatives? The purpose of derivative markets. One purpose which we call price discovery price discovery what do we mean we have the first purpose we call price discovery the second is risk management from risk management we have a third which is called improve market efficiency
and reduce transaction costs. So what do we mean by price discovery? We are saying participants to a derivative contract agree today to buy or sell an item at a future what price. So when we try to bet about future outcomes, we are able to get what? The future, future prices, isn't it? So when we are able to get future prices, we are uh, what? Getting a feel about the future outcomes, which is price discovery. Derivative as risk management tools. We know that one of the ways that people can reduce risk is through what? Hedging. When you do hedging, we are saying an hedger is someone with the core mandate to enter into derivative market to what? Exchange risk. For example, the party that is paying fixed here could be that there is what? Uncertainty uh, about, uh, sorry, the party that is paying fluctuating rate could be that there is uncertainty about the future occurrences. Isn't it? You'd like a fixed rate. So in order to get off that risk, he engages with the party that what? Wants to get that risk. Maybe party A has that the future earnings are what? Linked to the happenings of the economy. That's what want to merge that the revenues and the costs are what? Varying and party B has what? Fixed element. Yeah, that is the element of hedging. Or you like that you do not know how tomorrow will work up to be. We do not know what the KCB share tomorrow will be. If it will be either 50 shillings or 49 or 51. In order to hedge that risk, we went in the contract to fix the rate to be 50 shillings per KCB share. That is risk management. With the improved market efficiency. When we are saying market efficiency is the people participating in financial market, they become many. The buyers become many. The sellers become many. Of course, when there are many sellers and many buyers, the what? The market forces, isn't it? The forces of demand and supply are able to what? Function efficiently through uh, introducing many participants. Introducing many participants Pants. we also agree with me is that it is cheaper to buy a contract than to buy the entire what the entire the entire portfolio for example we have indices or an index, and index being a composition of different, maybe shares of different bonds. For you to gain exposure to an index, it is cheaper through to go to uh, through a contract that this index I'll buy it at a future date at this point or at this price, than to buy the individual what securities in an index. For example, the all share index in the Nairobi Securities Exchange, uh, the 25 share index has 25, uh, has 25 securities shares of the listed NSE uh, firms. So for you to gain at the 25 share index, you do not have to buy all the index. And that uh, convenience for not buying or the, uh, the, the items in the index gives you what? Reduce transaction cost. The other element we are supposed to see, look at, is the elementary principles or market participants. Who are the market participants in derivatives? Market participants.
there are three market participants. The first participant is called the arbitrators. The second participant is called the hedgers. And the third participants are called the speculators. The categories. We know the investment banks, they are the rest multinational corporations. But they fall in these broad categories. Who are arbitrages? Arbitrager is any market participant in the derivative market who tries to come and profit, profit from asset means pricing. And you make what you call risk-less profits. Risk-less profits. Yeah. For us to conceptualize an arbitrage, assume, for example, a bag of maize is selling in the Eldoret market for 2,000 shillings. To transport that base to Nairobi, where it is selling 3,000 shillings, we incur a transportation cost of 500 shillings per bag. So our initial cost being 2,000, add the transport cost of 500, we can be able to sell this bag in Nairobi for 3,000 shillings, thereby making a profit of 3,000 minus the initial cost of 2,000 minus the transport cost of 500. So the total cost will be 2,500, and our, our, our price in Nairobi is 3,000. We will be able to make a profit of what? 500. So the mispricing between the market, these participants are called what? The arbitrages. The hedgers primarily participate in derivative market to what? Read themselves. Read themselves off the risk. Yeah, so we have seen in risk management, one of the strategies is hedging. So hedgers read themselves, their primary motive to come in uh, derivative market is to get risk off. Speculators, these do two things. They enter the derivative market to do what? Forecasting. Forecasting. In forecasting, they want to make future bets of prices. For example, a speculator can say and speculate that the KCB share three months from now will be worth 52 shillings. And he make what? A contract. If it, and he says, I will maybe buy. If the KCB share will be trading at 51, isn't it? It does not what? Trade. But if it is trading at 53, higher than the bet he had already made, he enters the market, buys and sells at what? Higher prices. So they forecast what? To, to make profits, to make profits from the forecast. So speculators are the participants who make forecast and want to make profits from what? Future price movement. If prices move according to their wish, then they are able what? To make profits and this does not remove the reckless assumption of uh, of risk with that we can mention something about the elementary principles of derivative pricing the elementary principles of derivative pricing. Here, we are going to look at a preliminary glance on how derivative contracts are priced. First, we will introduce the concept 
of arbitrage from the market participants of arbitrage we have seen that it occurs when an equivalent asset or a combination of asset sell for two different prices this situation creates the opportunity to profit at no risk with commitment of any money so we have seen on how we can maybe take the stock that is selling more than that is given what value for example suppose a stock is trading at Kenya shillings 100 the stock is trading at Kenya shillings 100 and in one market and Kenya shillings 98 in another market Kenya shillings 98 yeah in in another market we simply buy the share for the Kenya shillings 98 in one market and immediately sell it for the Kenya shillings 100 in the other market we have a net position in the stock so so that it does not not matter the price whether it moves it means that we are buying and selling in so doing the sale of the stock at Kenya shillings 100 is more adequate to finance what the purchase of the stock at 98 naturally many market participants would like to do this which could create the downward pressure yeah on on the price where it is trading at 100 remember that with the market efficiency introducing many participants brings about efficiency because when you increase the demand here holding all the factors constant the price will come what the price will come down eventually the two prices must come together eventually this will come down yeah because people do not want this they are selling it is that eventually the price will move up a bit isn't it so that there is there is but a single price for the stock so now this will be kenya shillings 100 and this will be kenya shillings 100 so there is a single what price for the stock accordingly where there is no arbitrage opportunity we have the next concept we call the law of one price in the law of one price prices are set to eliminate the opportunity to profit at no risk with no commitment of one funds there are no opportunities for arbitrage or for arbitrage profit so we are saying no opportunities for arbitrage profit yeah markets in which arbitrage opportunities are either non-existent or are quickly eliminated are relatively efficient markets and we are saying that thus the most uh, violations of the market efficiency uh, when profits uh, arbitrage profits exist will be what will be uh, will be the key considerations when we will be doing what derivative pricing we are able to do in pricing set prices will be able to set prices that present that present no arbitrage opportunity we are going to set prices that present no arbitrage opportunity that is all touching on the elementary principles of derivatives thank you for having attended our today's session where we have begun the lesson from contingent 
claims. We have seen that derivatives has two major types of contract. The forward commitment, forward commitment, and contingent claim. In forward commitment, in our prior lesson, we learned about futures, swaps, and forwards. Contingent claims today, we have learned about options. The right to buy, but not the right to either buy or sell, but not the obligation. The right to buy, we have said, is a call option. The right to sell is the put option. The price that the participants pay for that right is called the option price. We have also seen there are a combination of various derivative instruments we've called the swaptions. We've called the hybrid instrument. They combine various forms of derivatives. And an example we have given is a swaption, where the party that is paying the variable would like to link it with an option that the way of exercise this right when a future occurrence happens. We have seen why derivative market exists. Because participants what? Not only want to know about future happenings, that is price discovery, they want to get rid of their risk through hedging, for example, which is risk management. And we have seen at length as how they improve market efficiency by what? removing arbitrage opportunities. They also reduce transaction risk, especially when you look at the want to gain exposure through an index. Instead of buying the individual security, you die what? You buy a contract. Market participants are three. Those driven by mispricings to make risk stress profit are arbitrages. Those who want primarily to get rid of risk are hedges. And those who want to do what? Make future betting through forecasting and make uh, profits when the bets go according to their wish as speculators. We have seen the elementary principles of derivative pricing touching on arbitrage and the law of one price. That takes us to the end of today's topic. Next, we'll be looking on forward market and contract. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to get yourself a copy of our professionally prepared study text and revision partners. Visit our shop along Tom Boyer Street, Pioneer House, third floor, opposite fire station. Hello, Lana. Welcome to Equity Investment Analysis. My name is Emlyn James Gwiri. I'll be taking you through free cash flow valuation lesson four. In lesson four, what we will look at, we will look at the three stage free cash flow model. And as an example, we will uh, be able to try and demonstrate the three stage M cash flow model. And as well, we will also look at the terminal value and the the models used in multi-stage valuation there so to start off let's look at the three stage free cash flow model as an example we will look at the following question harrison nyongesa is evaluating reliant capital limited using a three-stage growth model he has gathered the following information number one the current free cash flow to farm is 745 million outstanding ordinary shares are 309.39 million the firm has an equity beta of 0 0.9, the risk-free rate of 5.05, and equity risk premium of 5.5%. The cost of debt is 7.1%. 
The capital structure of the company consists of 20% debt and 80% equity. The long-term debt has a market value of um, $1,518 million. The annual growth rate for free cash flow to farm, FCFF, is 8.8% for the first year to the fourth year, 7.4% in year 5, 6% in year 6, 4.6% in year 7, and 3.2% in year 8 and thereafter. The corporation tax is 30% required. Number one, the required rate of return on equity. Number two, the weighted average cost of capital. Number three, the total value of the farm. Number four, the total market value of equity. Number five, the value of equity per share. So let's start by looking at part one. It is asking the required rate of return on equity. Rate of return on equity. Now, based on the information provided in note number three or the additional information number three, we have the equity better. So the formula for calculating the required rate of return is um, required rate of return is given as risk RF plus RM minus RF better, where the RF is risk free rate of return rm minus rf is equity risk premium there and beta is systematic matic risk there so rm in this case, is the return on the market. RM return on the market. So let's see if we have got all of those inputs. We've been told in note number three that the farm has an equity beta of um, 0 0.9. So we can say beta is equal to 0 0.9. Then we say that the risk-free rate RF is 5.05. 5, 5.05, like that. Then we have the equity risk premium of 5.5%. So we can 5.05%. Then the equity risk premium is 5.5%, like that. Now, based on that, we have all of the inputs to add that are going to be used to calculate the required rate of return. So required rate of return is given as the RF is 5.05% as given in the question, and then we now add the equity risk premium, 5.5% multiplied by um, the beta of 0 0.9. How much do we get as the required rate of return? Let's compute together. So we have 5.5 multiplied by 0 0.9. We have 4.95. So we have 5.05% plus 4.95%. How much do we get? We add 5.5%. Um, we get 10%. That answers part one of the question. Part two of the question reads as follows. The weighted average cost of capital, the work. The weighted average cost of capital formula is given as work, is given as weight of equity, cost of equity plus weight of debt, cost of debt, one minus tax. Then we have, um, if you have got preference shares, weight of preference shares plus um, rather times um, 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 cost of preference shares, like that. In this case, we've got two components of um, the cap within the capital structure, weight of equity and weight of debt, just equity and debt. So work, 
you can see the weight of equity um, the weight of equity we've been told in note number five that it is 20 percent debt and 80 percent equity so equity is 80 percent percent multiplied by the cost of equity the cost of equity we've been gotten over here 10 percent 0.1 plus the weight of debt is of obviously 20 percent 20 percent multiplied by the cost of debt which you've been given in note number four 7.1 percent 071 then we multiply that by one minus the tax rate the tax rate has been given to us in note number eight 30 percent that so how much is our work we can move over on this side work is how much So we have 80% multiplied by 0.1. That's 8. 8 plus, so in this case is 20, multiplied by 0 0.071, then multiplied by 0 0.7. 0 0.7. 9.94. We have 9.94 percent. Sorry, it is 8 plus 9.94. We have 17.94. 17.94 percent. That is the weighted average cost of capital. In required the, in the question number three, they are asking the total value of the farm. Part three. Now, based on the inputs uh, provided in the question, um, the total value of the farm, asking for VF is given as FCFF one plus G over work minus G or weighted average cost of capital minus G. We say that the FCFF is discounted against weighted average cost of capital. So, let's see, we've been given the FCFF. So, the value of the farm, now, in this case, we have to grow it. Now, based on this value, we need to, first of all, get um, um, the growth rate in FCFFs. So, what we do is that we have um, the stages, um, the different stages, um, the high growth phase, the stable stage, and then the declining phase that, we, that is um, existing in that question. So, we have the FCFF, so we have FCFF there, um, FCFF growth, that, then we have the FCFF there. So the growth rate we've been provided now, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 there. The first stage we are saying that the FCFF is 8.8%, that is note number 7, from the first year to the fourth year. So 8.8%, 8.8%, 8.8%, 8.8% there, from the first year through to the fourth year. Then we are told 7.4% in year 5, so 7.4%. Then in year 6, we have... 4.6 percent we have six percent year seven we have 3.2 percent 3.2 percent and then finally we have um we've been told 4.6 percent in year seven 4.6 sorry this is 4.6 percent so let's change this 4.6 percent and then 3.2 so 4.6 percent and then 3.2 percent so the fcff in year zero, the current FCFF is 745 million. So we can come here and have some workings. Have some very short workings here. And we're saying FCFF in year zero, we have got 745 million. So now we need to grow the 745 million 
two now year one based on these growth rates over here like that. So from year one three year two, um, through to year four, we just do it. But compute as follows. So year one, F C F F one is um, now seven forty five multiplied by one point zero eight eight. How much do we get there? So seven forty five. 745 multiplied by 1.088 is 10.56. Then FCFF2 is 810.56 multiplied by 1.088. By that factor still, multiplied by 1.088, 881. 881.89. FCFF3 is 881.89 multiplied by that factor, 1.088. Notice what we're doing. We are growing it for four years right here. So we are still on the third year. Multiplied by 1.088. 959.49. Yeah. Then FCFF year four is 959.49 multiplied by um, 1.088 that fcff for year five is given as 1043.93 multiplied by now which growth rate for year five, we are saying we have the 7.4 percent, so 1.074 multiplied by 1.074, we have 1121.18. So 1.074 it gives 1121.18. FCFF year six, what rate are we using? We are having that value, 1121.18, multiplied by what growth rate in year 6? Year 6, you can see, is 6%. Yes. So 1.06 gives us what? Multiplied by 1.06, we have um, 1188.45. FCFF, year 7, 1188.45, multiplied by... Um, now I can see 4.6 percent, 1.046. How much? 1.046. We have 1243.12. Then we have FCFF um, year eight. Um, is how much is 1243.12 multiplied? By I can see 3.4 per 3.2%. 1.032 multiplied by 1.032. 1282.90. Yeah. So these are the respective FCFFs after they've already been grown. So we're saying the FCFF for year one, we can come here. And say we put 810.56, 10.56, then 881.89, 881.89, then 959.49, 959.49 there. Then for year four, we have 1043.93, 43.93 there. Then we have 1121.18. 1121.18 there that is for year five don't worry about the space here we will be able to find a way how to squeeze it over here so 1121.18 then we have um 1188.45 that is for year six and put power six there this is power one two three four five this is power six um, um of the sixth year rather seventh year we have 1243.12. Then for the eighth year, 
we have 1282.9090 there. So once we have the eighth year value, because we need to go ahead and discount this back to the um, back to year zero. So what do we do? We need to get the terminal value. Terminal value value is given as FCFF in year eight discounted against work minus G like that. So what do we do? We get the FCFF for year eight twelve eighty two point nine discounted against weighted average cost of capital of seventeen point nine four zero point one seven nine four minus the growth rate. What is the growth rate in the eighth year? 3.2 percent so 0 0.032 what value do we get as the terminal value so we have 1282.9 divided by 0 0.1794 minus 0 0.032 8 Five, three. That is the terminal value component there. Once we have that, now we need to go ahead and discount this from year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, back now to um, to year zero. So that is the terminal value. We need now to get the corresponding uh, values um, or discount the corresponding FCFFs back to year zero. So let's do that on this. Um, side over here. So, so we're seeing that now since we have the FCFF, so 810 um, um, value of the farm is 810 over 1 plus weighted average cost of capital work. That is what we're discounting it with. The work is 17.94 0 0.1794 plus that was 810.56 to be precise then we have um 881.89 discounted against 1 plus 0 0.1794 power 2 plus i can see 959.49 divided by 1.1794 power 3 Plus, I can see 1043.93 divided by 1.1794 power 4. Then we have 1121.18 discounted again 1.1794 power 5 plus 1188.45. Over 1.1794 power 6 plus 1243.12 discounted against 1.1794 power 7 plus. Now, instead of discounting this value 1282.9 based on power 8, we will get that we already have the terminal value there 87. M03.53. So we have 8703.53 divided by 1.1794 power 7. Right. How what do we get as the value of the farm? 810.56 divided by 1.1794. Six eighty seven point two six eight eighty one point eight nine divided by one point one seven nine four four squared. We have six thirty four six thirty four plus nine fifty nine nine fifty nine point four nine. Divided by 1.1794 cubed 584 
1093 divided by 1.1794 1.1794 power 4 539 54 11 21.18 divided by 1.1794 power 5 491 Point three three eleven eighty eight point four five divided by one point one seven nine four power six four forty one point five eight plus come here twelve forty three. 1243.12 um, divided by 1.1794 power 7. Power 7, we have 391.64 plus the final term to add is 8703.53 divided by 1.1794 power 7. 2742 2742.00 there so getting the value of the farm vf we add up all of these values plus 391.64 plus 441.58 plus 491.33 plus 539.54 plus 584.87 plus 634 plus 8 plus 687.26 65 so we have 65.12.22 so that is the value of the farm now, moving on, let's look at the third part of the question, or the fourth part, rather, the total market value of equity. So, to get the total market value of equity, we already have the value of the farm there. Then, we less the value of debt, so that we can be able to get the value of equity. Part four, value of equity. Get the value of equity, we have the value of the farm minus um, debt value of equity, where VF value of farm, VE value of equity, which you're being asked. So the value of the farm, hence, we say, the value of the farm, which is 6512.22, minus the debt value. We've already been given the long-term debt is 1518, 1518 uh, million. How much do we have as the value of equity? So 6512.22 minus 1518. 1518. We have 4994. Point two two. Yeah. So once we have the value of equity being uh, 4994.22, we move on to um, the next question, um, which is asking us to compute the value of equity per share. So the value of equity is just given as the value this value of 49.94 divided by the number of shares outstanding so we have part five value 
of equity per share. How do we get it? We get 4994.22 divided by um, the number of shares outstanding. We have been told the number of shares outstanding are how much is 309.39 million. That is in note number 2. 309.39 million. So how much do we get? Divided by 309.9. Sorry, 0.39. We have 16.14 for per share. That is the value of equity per share. Now, having looked at that question, um, we have already concluded um, the four parts, of the, the five parts of the question. And now what we need to do is to conclude by looking at the multi-stage uh, valuation models based on the free cash flow valuation um, uh, model. So what we do is that we can move on on this side, move on, on this side. terminal value based on multi-stage valuation in free cash flow. Free cash flow. Now for us to get the value of um, the value of, of, of the firm. So terminal value in year N is given as trailing PE, P stroke E ratio, multiplied by um, the earnings in year N. That is it. Now, the terminal value in year N can also be gotten by the leading PE, P stroke E, or price earnings ratio. Now, we multiply that by um, forecasted earnings. Earnings in year n plus one there that's how you get the terminal value um, in both cases there so in the first case we're saying the terminal value which is in year n is based on the trailing pe recall that the trailing p stroke e is given as one minus b one plus g over r minus g there the leading P stroke E is given as 1 minus B over R minus G like that. So we, with, with the component of PE and the years of the earnings in years N, or this is the current earnings, this is the forecasted earnings or the year ahead earnings, we can be able to get the terminal value in multi-stage uh, valuation technique using the free cash flow um, model. This brings us to the end of free cash flow valuation. We hope that we can be able to join us in our next topic review, which will be price multiples. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to get yourself a copy of our professionally prepared study text and revision partners. Visit our shop along Tomboya Street, Pioneer House, third floor, opposite fire station. Welcome to Manifested Publishers. Hello, candidates, and welcome to our today's learning session. The subject is financial management. Today, we are going to start on a new subtopic under the topic cost of capital. The subtopic is leverage, leverage, leverage. Now, learners, uh, in this subtopic, we will 
study the different types of leverage. You'll also be expected to um, explain terms like operating risk, financial risk, total risk, and the calculation of operating leverage, the financial leverage, and the um, combined leverage. So learners, welcome to our today's lesson. The first question we will answer is, what is leverage? What's the meaning of leverage? Now, learners, leverage refers to the ability of a firm in employing long-term funds having a fixed cost to enhance returns to the owners. In other words, leverage is the amount of debt that a firm uses to finance its assets. Leverage leverage is the amount of debt a firm uses to finance its assets. Is the amount of debt a firm uses to finance its assets. I also said it's the ability of a firm in employing long-term funds. These are borrowed funds which have a fixed cost to enhance returns to its owners. So leverage is simply the amount of debt that you'll find in the capital structure of a firm. So that if a firm has, say, a capital structure comprising of equity, 10 million shillings, debt or debentures, say, uh, 8 million shillings, then we say that this debt is the amount of debt that the firm uses to do what? To finance its assets. These are long-term funds that you'll expect to find in a capital structure of a firm. Capital structure of a firm. So it's that simple, candidates. Leverage. So learners, a firm that uses a large percentage of debt in its capital structure to, fa to fund its assets is said to be highly geared. A firm with a lot of debt in its capital structure is said to be highly geared or highly levered. And a firm with no debt is said to be unlevered. You can put that down, that a farm, a farm with a lot of debt, a farm with a lot of debt in its capital structure is said to be highly levered. Is said to be highly levered, whereas a firm with no debt, a firm with no debt, a firm with no debt is said to be 
unlevered is said to be unlevered unlevered or ungeared or ungeared unlevered or ungeared so a farm with a lot of debt in its capital structure is said to be highly levered or highly geared highly geared whereas a farm with no debt in its capital structure is said to be unlevered or ungeared now learners there are three commonly used measures of leverage in financial analysis there are three there are three mainly used measures of leverage in financial analysis and these are a operating operating leverage b financial leverage and c combined leverage combined leverage there are three mainly used measures of leverage in financial analysis a operating leverage b financial leverage c combined leverage so let's define operating leverage operating leverage in this lesson we will define operating leverage operating leverage now operating leverage may be defined as the employment of an asset with a fixed cost in the hope that sufficient revenue will be generated to cover all the fixed and variable costs that is the meaning of operating leverage operating leverage i'll take it again operating leverage learners may be defined as the employment of an asset it is the employment of an asset it is the employment of an asset with a fixed cost with a fixed cost is employment of an asset with a fixed cost in the hope that 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 this asset or that asset okay um in the hope that uh, that asset or we can say in the hope that sufficient revenue will be generated in the hope that sufficient revenue will be generated from the employment of that asset will be generated from the employment of that asset so as to do what to cover the fixed okay uh, to cover to cover the fixed and variable costs 
It is the employment of an asset with a fixed cost in the hope that sufficient revenue, sufficient revenue, in the hope that sufficient revenue will be generated to cover the fixed and variable costs. To cover the fixed and the variable costs. In other words, learners, operating leverage. In other words, operating leverage is or may be defined as the firm's ability to use fixed cost, I mean fixed operating costs. To do what? To magnify the effects of changes in sales. All right? It is the employment. It is the, it is the, it is the ability to use fixed operating costs to magnify the effects of changes in sales. That's the meaning of operating leverage, to lever, to lever, all right, to magnify the effects of um, uh, changes in sales. So that's the meaning of operating leverage. Operating leverage. I say that there are three mainly used measures of leverage in financial analysis. We've discussed operating leverage. Then number B, we have financial leverage. Financial leverage. Financial leverage. Financial leverage. What is the meaning of financial leverage? Now, learners, financial leverage may be defined as the use of funds with a fixed cost in order to increase earnings per share. It is the use of funds with a fixed cost in order to increase earnings per share. In order to increase earnings per share. In order to do what? To increase earnings per share. In order to increase earnings per share. Now, financial leverage may also as well be defined as the ability of a firm to use fixed financial charges to magnify the effect of changes in earnings before interest and tax on the EPS. Do you understand, learners? All right. I've said financial leverage may as well be defined as the ability of a firm to do what? To use fixed financial charges to magnify the effect of changes in the EBIT on EPS. To magnify the effect of earnings before interest and tax in or on the earnings per share. Earnings per share. In operating leverage, is, we say that uh, is a employment of fixed charge um, 
fixed fixed charge uh, costs, all right? Employment of fixed cost in the hope that sufficient revenue will be generated to cover the fixed and variable costs. But in financial leverage, we say it is the use of funds with fixed cost. Fixed cost, in other words, we are talking about the, the fixed financial charges, the fixed financial charges like interest. Okay? Funds with fixed financial charges. In order to do what? To increase earnings per share. Then learners, we have combined leverage. What is combined leverage? Combined leverage. Combined leverage. Combined leverage, on the other hand, may be defined as the potential use of fixed costs both operating and financial, which magnifies the effect of sales volume change on the earnings per share of the firm. From the word combine. What are we combining? We are combining operating and financial leverage. It is the potential use of fixed costs. It is the potential use of fixed costs or funds with fixed costs. Okay? Both, both operating and financial both operating and financial because it's combined both operating and what and financial which does what which magnifies which which magnifies the effect of sales volume which magnifies the effect of sales volume change sales volume change on the earnings per share on the earnings per share on the earnings per share of the farm so combined leverage is a potential use of fixed costs both operating and financial which magnifies the effect of sales volume change on the eps of the farm on the eps of the farm so these are three main measures of leverage in financial analysis and on that note we'll come to the end of our today's lesson where we've introduced a subtopic leverage we've learned that leverage is the amount of debt a firm uses to finance its assets we've learned that a firm with a lot of debt in its capital structure is said to be highly a highly geared firm or a highly levered farm. We went further to learn that a farm with no debt in its capital structure is said to be unlevered farm or geared and geared farm. Then we've uh, discussed three mainly used uh, measures of financial analysis. In financial analysis, that is operating leverage, financial leverage, and combined leverage. 
We have defined operating leverage as the employment of an asset with a fixed cost in the hope that sufficient revenue will be generated to cover both fixed and variable costs. We have defined financial leverage as the use of funds with a fixed cost in order to increase earnings per share. Then lastly, we've defined combined leverage as the potential use of fixed costs, both operating and financial, which magnifies the effect of sales volume change on the EPS of the farm. So, learners, thank you for being attentive. Before we close the lesson, I'm going to give you uh, revision questions. Revision. Define the following terms. A, leverage, B, operating leverage, C, financial leverage, D, combined leverage. When answering these questions, please make sure the video and the exercise book is closed. Try and practice to retrieve what you have learned from your memory in our today's lesson. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello candidates, I gladly welcome you to our today's learning session. This is block revision. We are going to start the revision of the fundamentals of finance paper that was uh, done in May 2019. And uh, candidates, before I move to answer the first question, I want to send you to go and download the uh, five questions from our website, then attempt the first, uh, the, the, the questions first under exam conditions. Uh, this paper, the time allowed is three hours. You are to answer all questions. So go and first do this paper. Then come and see how I'll be solving the questions here on the board. That is the best way to revise. Before you come to this class, I'm sending you to first go and answer all the five questions in three hours. Uh, take time and uh, exam conditions. Uh, have full scraps. Download this paper. You will need a calculator and a pen. Go sit down, choose a conducive place for you to uh, answer the five questions. Make sure when answering the five questions, there are no interruptions. Switch off your phone, and uh, when you do that, you will be in a better position to benefit more from the revision of the May 2019 paper. A good student is one who takes instructions. That is the first instruction before you come to the block revision of the May 2019 paper. So the first question reads, explain the following terms as used in finance. Roman 1, financial intermediaries, 2 marks. Roman 2, risk return trade-off, 2 marks. Roman 3, stakeholders management, stakeholder management, 6, uh, 2 marks. Then uh, part B, describe three motives of holding inventory, six marks. So let us first answer part A and B, then we'll move on to answer part C, which is a question on risk and return. So candidates, this is fundamentals, fundamentals of finance. block revision 
of a sitting May 2019 are on question one. Question one, we are to explain the terms A Roman one. The first term is financial intermediaries. Financial intermediaries. What are financial intermediaries? Candidates, a financial intermediary is a financial institution. This is a financial institution such such as such as such as banks another example is a building society building society we have unit unit trust unit trust etc that holds that holds funds that holds funds from lenders from lenders from lenders in order in order to make loans to borrowers So is a financial institution is a financial institution that stands in between the lenders lenders and 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 borrowers. In an economy you'll always have people who have excess money than they need. So this money if you have excess money, then you would want to lend it out. And you can only lend this money out to borrowers. So the intermediary, financial intermediary, we've said examples like banks and so on. These are the uh, financial institutions that link the borrowers to the lenders. These are financial intermediaries. So these are financial institutions that is roman one then roman two we are to explain risk return trade-off risk return trade off risk return trade-off candidates suggests 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 that expected returns that expected returns are proportional are proportional 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 to the level of risk level of risk uh, risk taken risk taken and and as a result as a result investors prefer uh, investment projects investment projects that generate that generate that generate the highest return highest return let me say the highest rate of return the highest rate of return from a given a given level of risk for you to get 
or earn a higher return, then you have to take a higher level of risk such that the higher the risk, the higher the return. The expected return is proportional to the level of risk. If you want to go for a project whose risk is low, then you should not expect high returns. So this uh, term risk return trade-off suggests that expected returns are proportional to the level of risk taken. And as a result, investors, uh, investors prefer investment projects that generate highest rate of return, rate of return from a given level of risk. Number three, stakeholders management. Three, stakeholders or stakeholder, this is singular, stakeholder management. What is stakeholder management? First, we need to define what is the meaning of stakeholder. Stakeholder is a stakeholder is an interested group or an interested entity, um, an interested entity in the affairs of a company. Okay, these are groups that have interests in a company because the decisions that the company makes affects them or the decision that they make may affect the company. So a stake, stakeholder comprise of uh, either individuals or even groups or, or groups who are affected by organization's activities or who can affect its achievement of objectives. Okay? And this would include the shareholders, the, the management, the uh, the employees, the government, the members of the public, and so on. So that is the meaning of stakeholder. Here we need to explain stakeholder management. Learners, stakeholder management refers to the policy towards, refers to the policy towards all interested all interested groups all interested groups all interested groups that have a stake in the enterprise is a, a policy statement, is a, a guideline. Policy is simply a broad guideline. Is a guideline that uh, states or stipulates um, how the interests of these groups or individuals will be taken care of or will be managed. So that is the meaning of stakeholders management. Then. Uh, that will mark the end of part A. That is part A. Candidates were expected to, to explain, and each explanation would earn the candidate two marks. So this is two marks, two marks, two marks. Total, six marks. Total, six marks. Then coming to part B, describe three motives of holding inventory. Six marks. Three what? Three motives of holding inventory. These motives should not be confused by the motives of holding money or cash. The question is specific three motives of holding inventory. Part B, 
three motives of holding inventory three motives of holding inventory the first motive is precautionary motive the second motive is speculative motive the third motive is transaction motive three motives one transaction motive two precautionary motive and speculative three so the question is describe the three motives the first one i've said let's begin with transaction transaction motive what is it all about the reason for holding cash candidates the motive for holding not cash but inventory the motive for holding cash what are the reasons what are the motives that would uh, lead an enterprise to hold inventories or stocks one is transaction motive what is it all about now uh, the reason why an organization would hold inventory is transaction motive which means uh, the motive would be to avoid to avoid what we call bottlenecks bottlenecks in in its production these are unnecessary stoppages you would need if you want to have continuous production of uh, products or goods then you need to have continuous supply of raw materials because you cannot you cannot produce finished goods unless you have raw materials so a company would need require raw materials which will then be processed or converted into finished finished goods so one important motive of holding inventories having inventories in store holding inventory means storing inventory is to ensure that there are no bottlenecks there are no stoppages in production no stoppages in production by maintaining inventories we can say by maintaining inventories the enterprise ensures that the enterprise ensures that um, uh, ensures that ensures 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 um, that uh, production production is not interrupted is not interrupted and also and we can say um, sales are not unavailable because there are two things here there should be no interruption in supply of raw materials if there is no interruption of supply of materials then there will be no interruption of availability of finished goods so there are two ways uh, or reasons or perspectives there is the aspect of the raw material and the finished finished goods then the second motive is the precautionary motive number two precautionary motive precautionary motive precautionary motive now the reason an enterprise should hold inventory is to cushion to cushion the enterprise to cushion the enterprise or the company to cushion the company against 
against um, against against um, unpredicted unpredicted business. Sometimes business may not be predictable. You may not know uh, or be be hundred percent sure that tomorrow you'll have raw materials. There may be what we call uh, shortages, unexpected shortages in supply of raw materials. So a uh, prudent organization would uh, hold inventories to cushion the company against such shortages of raw materials in the market. Here we are talking about situations like unforeseen unforeseen slump in the supply of raw materials. So to avoid uh, against, uh, uh, against such an unpredicted business, then the company should hold, should hold inventories. Then uh, the third motive, the third motive, number three, is, is this is transaction precautionary. Then number three, speculative motive. Speculative motive. The company may hold inventory so as to take advantage of... Uh, to take, let me write, to take uh, advantage, to take advantage of price fluctuations, fluctuations. For example, if the prices of raw materials are expected to increase, then it may be uh, prudent for the company to buy raw materials beforehand, before the increase in prices. These are uh, fluctuations. So again, the prices of the raw materials may also um, reduce. Okay, if the prices of raw materials are expected to reduce, then the company should hold few quantities of uh, inventories so that. Uh, when the prices are lowered, the company will buy the raw materials at a lower price than previous prices. So these are the motives of holding uh, inventories. And you may have this, that two max, two max, two max, total six max. You may have uh, noticed that the motives of holding inventory are th the same, okay, in terms of the, 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 the headings, but the explanation is different. So there are three motives of holding inventory, that is transaction motive, precautionary motive, speculative motive. There are also three main uh, motives of holding cash or money, that is transaction motive, precautionary motive, speculative motive. The same headings, but the explanation different. So make sure you revise on the uh, motives of holding cash or money. So having done part A and B, we can now move on to answer part C. Let me read it. It says, Zeltex Limited shares cost 120 shillings each and pay no dividends. All right. The possible prices that the company's shares might sell uh, for at the end of the year with the respective probabilities are provided below. So we have the prices and the probabilities that are provided in the two columns required. Roman 1, the expected return of the company's shares for max. Roman 2, standard deviation of return for max. So candidates will first answer part 
uh, Roman 1, the expected return of the company's shares. The expected return of the company's shares. Expected return of the company's shares. This is uh, C, C Roman 1. The expected return, expected return of the company's shares will be equal to the summation of the probability probability times the expected return. Okay? So we'll have a table, then this in a table, price in shillings, price in shillings, 115, 120, 125, 130, 135, 140. Price in shillings. Then I'll have the probabilities. Probabilities or probability PI. The probabilities are given in the question 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So we will multiply the probabilities with respective prices, with the respective prices. So I'll have 115, so 115 times 0.1. Eleven point five. This is uh, twelve point zero. And I have one twenty five times point two. Twenty five point zero. And I have one thirty times zero point three. One thirty times point three. Thirty nine point zero. I'll have one thirty five times point two this zero there is twenty seven point zero then zero point one times one forty fourteen point zero this is uh, pi times expected return it's expected return so we will get the summation and that will be the expected return. So we'll sum 11.5 plus 12 plus 25 plus 39 plus 27 plus 14. It's equal to 128.5. point five. So the expected return is equal to 128.5 shillings. These are how many marks? These are four marks. These are how many marks? Four marks. One, two, three, four, five, six. These are mark for that one. Some mark there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four marks. Four marks. Each tick, half a mark. So that is part one. This should be part one. It's part two. It's part one. Yes, part one. So let's answer part two. It says standard deviation of return, another four marks, standard deviation of return, four marks. So candidates, I will need this space to answer, 
to calculate the standard deviation. Standard deviation. So, standard deviation part 2, standard deviation which is equal to, uh, sometimes you write it as SD, standard deviation or we use that symbol and the standard deviation for for this return the standard deviation of the return will be equal to the square root of the summation of the probability times the actual return minus the expected return squared So we'll uh, use that formula to calculate the standard deviation. So we have the price, we have another table, shillings, 115, uh, 120, 125, 130, 135, and 140. These are prices. Then the probabilities, PI, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Then um, candidates, another column we need here is the deviation. So we need to calculate the deviation. The deviation is uh, actual return. This is the actual return minus the expected return. Expected return which we calculated here 128.5. We have that column. Then we'll have another column for PI times actual return minus expected return squared. So I have, can now go ahead and, uh, and subtract 115, 115, this 115, minus the expected return of 128.5 is minus 113.5 next is 120 this 120 minus 128.5 is equal to negative 8.5 then 125 minus 128.5 is negative 3.5 130 minus 128.5 so 1.5 positive 135 minus 128.5 6.5 140 minus 128.5 is 11.5 11.5 so we will square the deviation then multiply by the standard deviation we square this deviation this is these are deviations 
because we are getting the difference between the actual and the expected. This is the expected return. So we will square 13.5 uh, squared times 0.1 uh, this is equal to 18.225 next I have 8.5 square times 0.1 7.2 225 next 3.5 squared times 2.45 next I have 1.5 squared times 0 0.3 0 0.675 next 6.5 6.5 squared times 0 0.2, 8.45. Lastly, 11.5, 11.5 square times 0 0.1, 13.225. So we get the summation. We add. This is what we are adding. So 13.225 plus 8.45 plus 0.675 plus 2.45 plus 7.225 plus 18.225. Answer is 50.25 remember these are shillings so shillings are not uh, percentage so the standard deviation will be the square root of 50.25 square root of 50.25 the square root of 50.25 this will be equal to the square root is 7.088. That is the standard deviation. And that is uh, the end of that question. How many marks? These are four marks. Four marks. Four marks. Four marks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Four max. So candidates in an exam, after having done enough practice, you don't need to go through all these writings because you can see this price I had already, I already had a column here for price. I'm writing it that way so that you can see clearly and understand but in an exam you don't have to repeat this column here and that column there in an exam because you are also being tested on speed you should avoid repeating okay so here if i was an exam i would just come here and have the column p p i probability actual return minus expected return squared so all i needed to answer part two is to have this formula here because the probability i have it here the actual return i have it here the expected return i have it here this this supposed to be square root then the answer after sum, summing, because this is summation, after getting the summation of um, the probability times the square root of uh, these deviations, the sum here, okay, the sum here, which 
in our case there is 50.25 just come here and get the square root of that because the calculator again you have it so that all those working are not necessary you don't earn marks by repeating such columns but i only did that for the purposes of understanding but in an exam you need to uh, be saving time and earn the marks and you can only uh, do that if you've had enough practice candidates this is your revision partner in this book we've summarized enough questions for you under this topic of risk and return there are how many questions we have 17 questions 17 questions some of them are past paper questions this topic was introduced recently in the uh, financial uh, mid fundamentals of uh, finance syllabus but we have gathered more other questions which can help you revise in this topic so make sure you answer all the 17 question in this book before attend uh, before doing your exams the, 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 forth the forthcoming exams make sure you've done all the questions in this book you'll have enough practice to enable you answer these questions in a very short time very short time these are marks that you need to scoop very easily you can on only do that by practicing so thank you for being attentive this was our first lesson in um, answering the questions that were tested in may 2019 i told you before you come to this revision make sure you do these questions those who uh, obeyed you must have uh, seen where you went wrong because I expect you to mark your work as we are moving uh, on to answer the question. So in our next lesson, we are going to answer the second question. Second question. Thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>
we need to understand first what do we mean when we talk of merger what it mean when we talk of acquisition we must understand the definition of these two terms and actually what it mean when we say that two or more farms merged together or a farm acquired another farm to uh, to begin with we understand what merger is the merger this is a combination of two or more farms where the identity of each farm disappears after the acquisition simply in a merger if you have a company a you combine it with another company b you get a company c the identity of the two farms that are being combined together disappears after the uh, after the merger so simply merger is a combination of two or more farms after which the identity of the two farms that are merging disappears and a completely new farm is formed that is merger the next one we talk of acquisition in an acquisition also known as the take over bid it means that two farms comes together but the identity of one farm dominates the other farm when two farms come together there is that farm that will retain its identity so simply we can say that if we have a farm a that has come together with a farm b we will get a farm a so it is a farm a that acquired farm b so the identity that disappears is for the farm that is being acquired the farm that acquires another farm is known as a predator the farm that is being acquired is known as the target so when a company acquires the other farm the identity of the predator is retained the identity of the target disappears that is an acquisition uh, an acquisition or uh, actually an acquisition in uh, in a, where businesses combine together then of course we've understood what merger is now having understood what merger is and what acquisition is we need to look at the classification of merger and acquisition classification of merger and acquisition for the purpose of this topic that is merger and acquisition we'll be using merger and acquisition interchangeably for all purpose as if they mean the same so you find that a question on merger or a question on acquisition will be tested the same way so we need to understand the type or the way mergers and acquisitions are the first one we talk of horizontal merger or acquisition the horizontal merger number two, we talk of vertical merger or acquisition and the third one we talk of conglomerate merger or acquisition so in the classification of merger and acquisition there is horizontal merger and acquisition there is vertical merger and acquisition there is conglomerate merger and acquisition to start with let us start with the horizontal merger or acquisition what do we mean when we talk of the horizontal merger and acquisition in this case two farms are combined together and these two farms are in the same level of business for example we can have two banks combining together they are at the same level of activity so if we have a bank a you add a bank b you will have one entity in a horizontal merger it is simply a combination of two or more farms that are at the same level of activity 
that is the horizontal merger. The main objective or purpose for a horizontal merger is to ensure that there is increase in market share. As a result, the firm will enjoy the economies of scale. So when we have the horizontal merger, the services or the goods offered by the, the, the merging company is the same. So as a result of that, the two firms becomes one big entity offering the same, uh, offering the, the same services and similar goods. So they enjoy the economies of scale. Number two, we talk of the vertical merger or acquisition. In a vertical merger or acquisition, this is where two entities at different level of activities combine together to form a completely new entity. For example, if you have one entity X, there is another entity Y, the output, output of entity Y is an input, input for entity X. That is a vertical merger. Two firms which may be in the same industry, but one firm's output is an input for the other firm. In such a case, when the two firms come together, we say that it is a vertical merger. The vertical merger in this case ensures that the output of one firm will be an input of the other firm, and as a result, there is a ready market for the output for the one firm. The other thing is that the firm whose input is an output of the other firm is guaranteed of the supply of the input. So the major uh, uh, objective of vertical merger is that there is creation or provision of market for, the, for one firm's output. And again, on the other end, there is a guarantee supply of input for the other firm. Then we have the other type of merger, number three. This is what you call the conglomerate merger. In a conglomerate merger, this is where two or more firms in completely different industries come together to form a new firm. You have a firm A and a firm B. You combine them together, but they are in different industry. For example, this firm may be in manufacturing and this one is in communication. Or you have one firm in communication industry or the other one is in the banking industry. When you look at the two firms, they are not, they are not related. They are in different industries. They offer different goods and different services. When such a combination occurs, we talk of conglomerate merger or acquisition. And what is the main objective? What is the main reason for conglomerate merger? The main objective for conglomerate merger is to ensure that there is risk diversification. And the risk diversification is usually achieved when the correlation between the returns of the two firms, that is the correlation between the returns of the two firms, is negative, such that when one firm is generating income, the other one may not be generating income. When one firm performance is low, the other firm's performance is high. In such a case, it guarantees the investor continued income throughout the year. So we talk of the conglomerate merger with an objective of risk diversification, and it is achieved when the correlation coefficient between the returns of the, two, uh, of the two firms are negative. So we having understood that, what merger and acquisition is, we have the types of merger, the horizontal merger. We say that two firms at the same level of activity combines together to form a completely new entity. Vertical merger, this is where we have two firms 
which may be in the same industry, but they are in di at different level of activity. A good example, we can have a car assembling company acquiring a tire manufacturing firm. A car assembling firm requires the output of a tire manufacturing firm as its input. That makes uh, the combination a vertical merger. The output of one firm is an input of the other firm. The other one is the conglomerate merger. We say that it is a combination of two or more firms in different industries with an objective of risk diversification. So that is the general overview or understanding of what merger and acquisition is. Now, when you talk of the merger and acquisition, a very important concept we need to understand is that when firms are coming together, each firm has its shareholders. They are all the owners in each farm. For a farm, for the farm shareholders to release their ownership and they join the other farm, there must be some consideration. Simply, if a farm X want to acquire a farm Y, this X, the acquiring, we said is a predator. The farm being acquired, that is farm Y, we said is a target. When this farm predator is acquiring the target, the shareholders in the target must be compensated to forgo their ownership in farm Y so that they can become either shareholders in farm X or they can go, they are paid, they leave their ownership. Now, how do we get the forms of consideration? How are the, uh, the shareholders in the target farm compensated to forego their ownership? There are various forms of consideration, and the most common ones are, number one is cash consideration. Cash consideration. Number two, we have share for share exchange. Share for share exchange. Number three, we talk of issue of convertible securities. The issue of convertible securities. And the fourth one, we talk of a combination. A combination of any two or the three above forms. So a combination of any two or the three above forms, that means we can have partial consideration in cash and issue of shares or cash and issue of convertible securities or issue shares and partially convertible securities or a combination of the three where the shareholders in the target are paid cash, they are issued with some shares, they are issued with convertible securities. So the forms of consideration, we need to understand what are the implications of cash consideration the implication of share for share exchange, the implication of issue of convertible securities as form of consideration in a merger and acquisition. I want us to start with the cash consideration. We see what are the implications when the shareholders of the target firm are paid in cash. That is cash consideration. Now, let's start with that one. We say number one, cash consideration. The cash consideration. Now, when it comes to the cash consideration, it means that if a firm X want to acquire a firm Y, this is the predator and this is the target. The predator want to acquire the target. There are shareholders in this firm Y, the shareholders in the target firm, and there are shareholders in firm X. 
when making a decision to acquire and they agree that the shareholders in Y will be paid in form of cash, it means the predator firm will purchase the ownership in Y and the shareholders or the owners in Y will be paid in cash, they forgo their ownership. So what is the implication of that? Number one, there is huge cash outflow. Huge cash outflow from the predator. Huge cash outflow from the predator, which may cause liquidity charges in the predator entity. Number two is that there is no dilution and control of ownership in the predator. We talk of no dilution or uh, no dilution in ownership and control of the predator entity. The shares or the shareholders in the predator entity will retain their control or their ownership in the farm because the shareholders of the target company will be paid in cash and they will leave their interest in the investment. The other one, number three, no change in gearing of the, of the predator farm. The gearing level does not change. This is because there is no issue of debt. There is no change in the equity level. There is no change in the debt level of the predator farm. So as a result, when the shareholders in the target are paid, there, there will be no change in the amount of equity and the, in the amount of debt. The other one, number four, is that the shareholders in the target are paid and using the proceeds, they can invest in risk-free securities. The investment in farm Y may be considered risky. When the shareholders in Y are paid, that is in the target entity are paid, they can use the proceeds to move from a risky venture to a risk-free secu risk securities. That is, use the proceeds and invest them in the, in the government securities. The other one, number five, is that there is no transaction cost. No transaction cost means that unlike the issue on sale of shares in the market, where a shareholder will go to the market and try to sell the shares, under merger and acquisition, where shareholders are paid in cash, they do not incur transaction cost. So simply, these are the implications of cash consideration when an entity target shareholders are paid in cash. Now, we look at the next form of consideration, and we've talked of share for share exchange. Or well, before we look at the share for share exchange, I would want us to start with issue of convertible securities. The issue of convertible securities. Now, what do we mean by issue of convertible securities? Number two, this is issue of convertible securities. Now, the convertible securities, this is where the shareholders in the target are issued by some securities from the predator entity. The shareholders in the target entity will forego their equity in this firm, and they are given securities like debentures, like preference shares, like loan stock, such that after the merger and uh, after the merger or acquisition, the shareholders in the target becomes lenders in the uh, in the predator. So they, they are entitled 
to preference dividend at the end of the year, they are entitled to interest at the end of the year. In case they are issued with preference shares, they will be paid preference dividend. In case they are issued with loan stock or debentures or any other form of debt that attract interest, they will be paid interest at the end of the financial period. So the target shareholders no longer become shareholders in the predator. They become lenders in the predator. So they continue as investors in the predator entity, but at a different level as compared to what they were before the merger and acquisition. Now, what are the implications of this form of consideration? That is, when the shareholders in a firm being acquired are issued with the debentures or they are issued with the preference shares. The first one is that it increases the gearing ratio in the predator farm. When a predator issued debentures or preference shares to the shareholders in the target, the gearing or the level of debt in the predator farm increases. It therefore increases or raises the financial risk in the predator entity. That is implication number one. Implication number two, there is no dilution in ownership and control. No dilution in ownership and control of the predator farm. This is because the shares in the predator will not change after the merger and acquisition. They retain their shares at the same level. So there is no dilution in ownership and control. The shareholders in the predator retains their ownership in that farm, no change in the ordinary share capital structure. The other one, number three, it conserve cash for predator. This form of consideration will conserve cash for predator. This is because no cash payment that is done to the target. So the cash is retained in the predator and the predator cannot experience any liquidity charges after the merger and acquisition. As a result, the firm will have stability in cash flow. The other one, number four, is that the predator enjoys interest tax shield benefit. The predator, if the predator issued debentures, loan stock to the shareholders in the target, the predator will pay interest at the end of the year. Such interest is allowable for tax purposes. To that end, the predator company will enjoy interest tax shield, interest tax shield, which is equivalent to interest per annum times tax rate. So the predator will enjoy interest tax shield, which is a benefit to the firm because interest is allowable for tax purposes, unlike the dividends that are payable by a company to its shareholders. The interest is allowable. Now, when you look at this, they are the, the implications of issue of convertible securities. Now, the other one we need to look at, we need to look at the share for share exchange. This is very common in most firms. And when you talk of the share for share exchange, we need to understand it in a very detailed way. And that is what I want us to look at. And this is number three. Number three. This is share for share exchange. The share for share exchange. A share for share exchange arises when a predator company issues some shares to the shareholders in the target in exchange for the shares held by the shareholders in the target. <coughs> At this point, we look at the predator acquiring another entity 
the target. The predator will issue its shares to the shareholders in the target. So the shareholders in the target becomes a part of the owners in the predator. Before we look at how to go about the share for share exchange, we can look at the implication of this approach of consideration in a merger and acquisition. The implication number one, there is, uh, there is dilution in ownership and control of predator farm. The predator will issue new shares to shareholders in the target. So the number of shares in the predator increases, more shareholders are brought into the predator company. So as a result of that, the ownership is diluted and the control is diluted in the predator entity. Number two is that it lowers the gearing. It lowers the gearing ratio. That means the amount of equity in the predator increases with the debt remaining constant. So it lowers the gearing ratio in the predator entity. At the same time, it reduces the financial risk in the predator entity. Number three, it conserves cash to predator entity. It conserves cash to predator entity. That means that the predator entity is not likely to suffer liquidity charges after the merger and acquisition where shareholders in the target are issued with the shares and they, bec they become shareholders in the predator entity. So the cash in the predator is retained in the predator. There is no charges or there are no charges in the liquidity of the predator. Now, having understood this, there are some other aspects of merger and acquisition that we need to understand, especially when you talk of the share for share exchange. In any arrangement of merger and acquisition, there must be an agreement on exchange ratio. An exchange ratio is determined based on the market price per share for the shares in the predator entity and the shares in the target entity. So the first thing we need to understand under merger and acquisition, we need to understand what is exchange ratio. How many shares should be issued by the predator for how many shares in the target? We say that exchange ratio is equal to the offer price price by predator over market price per share of predator. The offer price by the predator, this is the amount the predator company is willing to pay for every share held by a shareholder in the target entity. You divide by the market price per share of the shares in the predator company, the price at which the shares in the predator company are trading in the market. So we determine an exchange ratio. That one must be determined. The other thing that must be considered when uh, a farm is acquiring another farm or in case of a merger is that number two, the farms in uh, the shareholders in the two farms may get into a, into an agreement or they, they may arrive into an exchange ratio that will guarantee them an EPS similar to what it was before the merger and acquisition. And this is called the non-dilutive exchange ratio. Ratio. A non-dilutive exchange ratio, it is an exchange ratio that will ensure that the EPS 